Well, as the, as the title says, it's care and maintenance of hatchling box turtles. And um, I uh, have never really kept baby box turtles before. Uh, I, for, uh, for years when I was young in East Texas, I kept box turtles, but I kept them temporarily and I kept them outdoors. And so uh, I would collect them in the early in the spring and summer and keep them through the summer and let them go pretty much same place I caught them. I even had a dog uh, that for some reason I never asked her, asked her to, but she would go out and find box turtles and bring them to me. And uh, that made it easy for me to find them. But uh, I never kept them in the house and I never uh, had little ones. You don't see little turtles and I'll talk more about that later. Uh, then later, uh, much later in my life, when I ended up in West Texas, uh, there are box turtles out there and I did much the same thing, except that I kept them in my backyard. Again, I never kept them in the house and never kept the little ones. I did find little ones in my backyard that had hatched, but I didn't bring them in the house or anything. I just let them do whatever little box turtles do, which I didn't know what they do at that time and don't know a whole lot about it now, really. But uh, I was intrigued when I was asked to uh, by Sarah uh, Vanderleek uh, to help her get another batch of baby box turtles ready for the head starting program at Leela. And I'll talk about that later as well. And so I dove into finding out what I didn't know about baby box turtles. And there was a whole lot I did not know. And some things I thought I knew were not accurate in the first place. So uh, uh, I've spent the uh, last year or so uh, learning about box turtles, specifically the, the hatchlings. And so I'd like to share some of what, I've, uh, what I've, I've learned with you there. And uh, this little guy's peeking out of, of the uh, house that he lives in. Uh, I want to use this slide to tell you that uh, if, you, if you have questions, you can use the chat function to ask, ask those questions. And if we have time at the end of the presentation, I will answer as many of those questions as I can. Uh, also, some of the slides in this presentation are a little lengthy uh, and have a lot of words on them. And for that, I apologize in advance. But I had so much information, I got kind of carried away in sharing it. And if anyone wants more specific information about the content of one of the slides or something like that, please feel free to contact me and I'll, I have contact information at the end of the presentation. I'll be happy to answer your question. And, and if I don't know the answer, which is likely, that gives me a uh, motivation to look up that uh, answer to that question. So the next time I'm asked, I won't have to look it up again. So don't be shy in asking me uh, questions on this. Um, the map of box turtles. Okay, uh, first of all, box turtles uh, more or less are what you call uh, a North American phenomenon. There are turtles, box turtles, that live in Southeast Asia. They're called Chinese box turtles, and they are box turtles, but they're in a different uh, different genus. Uh, box turtles are all in the terrapine genus, and the and the Chinese box turtles are in the Kuara genus. So I'm going to focus strictly on North America, and as this map shows. Uh, they are rather, I mean, I say rather limited. They, are, they don't cover all of North America. And one thing that struck me when I found this map was box turtles have a lot of skills, but I did not know that they respected state and local boundaries or international boundaries so well, but that's, that's quite amazing. So we live in the, the light blue. And uh, what we've got is a species of box turtle called the Terrapine Carolina. That is mainly in the eastern part of the United States. If you look at the, uh, the, the legend on the map there, the dark blue and the light blue uh, Carolinas are in there. They have the terrapine ornata in the western part of the United States, more or less the, the central and southern part. And both species overlap in, in the center. There are five subspecies of the Carolina and, on, and two species of the ornata. Uh, there's little research done on the Mexican box turtles. There's very little research done on them. There's little research done on box turtles in general uh, compared to many other animals and, and creatures, but uh, Mexican box turtles, there's a lot of questions about those. And so that's, that's another issue completely. Uh, the, uh, well, this is the taxonomy of the box turtles as you can look at that. Uh, I've highlighted in yellow, the ones that are found in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. They uh, are the uh, ter ter Terrapine Carolina Trianguis 
and the terrapene ornata, or ornata ornata in this case. And uh, I'm going to focus on the three-toed box turtle because that's what I, we have in, or I have uh, that I am uh, trying to raise a little bit. Uh, the uh, problem is that the three-toed box turtle and the ornate box turtle, uh, they can integrate. And so you can have uh, a three-toed box turtle and uh, uh, ornate box turtle, and they get real friendly. And then you end up with something that is not really a pure three or three-toed or ornate. And I've, we have some of those out at, at Leela. Uh, and I can't tell though, if I've got those such intergrades because about the only way when they're small to tell that is to look at the coloring uh, on the shell and on the legs and on the head, but those things evolve over time. And so I'm not gonna make any guesses. I'm playing like they're all three-toed box turtles. They have three toes on their back, their, their back feet, three claws. Oh, excuse me, the, the name, their name, Triunguis, that means uh, three clawed. And so they've got three claws on their back at feet and four on the front. But when you get to the intergrades, you can sometimes have three toes in the back and it's not a pure three-toed box turtle. But I don't, I don't discriminate. They're all box turtles to me. So uh, the ones you would see if you saw one in your backyard or out on a hike would probably be one of the two uh, pictured there. Both of those pictures were taken at Leela. Okay, uh, head starting box turtles. As uh, Sarah Vanderleek mentioned a few months ago in a presentation, a lot of places uh, box turtles are disappearing. Their biggest enemy in the world, and I don't mean that in terms of a, uh, an aggressive focused enemy, but their biggest threat in the world is humans, period. Clearing of land, building of roads, such things as that can completely obliterate the habitat of box turtles. Uh, one of the things that fascinated me years ago was I found a, uh, uh, a mention of box turtles, a study that had been taken, I think it was North Carolina or someplace like that. Anyway, the, they said that a box turtle could hatch, live its entire life and die in an area no larger than a football field. And when we say live its entire life, we're talking decades. And I thought that was just absolutely amazing. They don't get around much. And so you, you uh, build a subdivision, how many football fields do you clear? Well, that's a lot of potential box turtle habitat. And so what we're trying to do out at Leela is something called uh, head starting, where we take the baby box turtles and protect them uh, for a while until they're able to be reintroduced into the, the natural world. Um, as I say up there, the first year mortality rate on box turtles is um, estimated to be about 80%. If you go out hiking or, or walking pretty much anywhere, there's, there's likely some box turtles around you, but you won't see any hatchlings. Uh, there's not a whole lot that's known about from the time they hatch from the egg until they're two or three years old. They just disappear, kind of like the sea turtles do when they leave the coast of Texas, the, the hatchlings. But uh, they, they burrow underground in the leaf litter and such, and they basically live there uh, unseen for some time. However, they're very small and everything that eats uh, well, carnivores and many omnivores will eat baby box turtles. They're sort of like the, you know, like, like, like hors d'oeuvres, very small. And uh, the winter can be really cold and so forth and so on. But any, anyway, uh, 100 box turtle eggs laid, we might end up with 20 that survived the first couple of years. And the key to survival seems to be real simple, how much they weigh. And that study done in Michigan, and I've, I've uh, given you the reference there to it, it basically said that body mass was positively associated with survival probability, period. They, they worked on a program where they tried to, tried to uh, head start the programs using environmental enrichment. And that's where you keep them in an enclosure that as best you can mimics the uh, environment in which the box turtle would live. And I can tell you that is extremely difficult. I will go so far, this is my opinion, that's impossible because by the very nature of putting them in an enclosure, you have altered the environment that they would have been in had they not been put in an enclosure. It's sort of like the turtle Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Uh, to observe them is to alter what uh, they would have been doing had you not observed them. So what they found out 
though, in this program that while that may help a bit, they couldn't weren't definite on uh, the, the results of the program did not definitively state that that environmental enrichment helped that much, but they did find that the bigger bigger is better. And uh, so what they, the, the, the end of the study as far as we were concerned was that we need to fatten these little guys up and but fatten them up in the correct way. Uh, there's a word in that uh, quote that I want to uh, explain, Kelonian, C-H-E-L-O-N-I-N. That's a Greek word for turtle, and it's not used in science that much, in taxonomy that much, but it is still used in, in the literature. The pictures at the bottom, the first three pictures from the left, are some of the turtles that are in the program at Leela. Now, obviously, they're fairly large. The idea is to take the small ones and get them up till they are can be have a better chance of surviving outside, and that's about four to five years. Three, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm not real sure on, 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 on that, but all of these that you see in the picture there uh, either are still at Leela, have not gotten big enough to let go, but some of them, particularly the ones on the left hand, I mean, excuse me, the right hand side, the ones eating, fighting over the worm, those have uh, have been released. They got big enough, they graduated. And when they graduate, uh, a tracking device is put on their, uh, put on their shell. And uh, Sarah goes out and she finds where they are on a very regular basis. Tracking box turtles is something I've never done. Tracking box turtles is something I really don't want to ever do. It is a hard job and I do not have an affinity for poison ivy. So I will leave that to the younger, smaller people who can creep around under the bushes. But I'm focusing on the beginning as opposed to the end of the program. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. However, if you are interested in the process as a whole, you can contact Sarah Vanderleek and I've got her uh, email address there. She said that was perfectly fine and she will be able to help you with uh, answer questions you have or, or, or things such as that much better than I do. So you notice the food pile of food there. Uh, that's, that's, that's the way we fed the turtles or feed the turtles. They just started coming out this past week. So the first offering of food was put down for them to eat uh, out at Leela uh, two days ago. And uh, we'll, we'll check on them again tomorrow. Okay, facilities used. Now this is one of those slides that's got way too many words on it and for that I apologize. Uh, but I wanted to, to focus on this because one of the things I found about, about the hatchlings is that they are a lot harder to take care of than the uh, juveniles or the adults. Uh, for one thing, it's like, like any, any creature, when they're smaller, lower body weight, they're more susceptible to adverse climatic and environmental conditions. And so uh, uh, that's one of the biggest challenges. And I, what I did was uh, when Sarah asked me, would I keep these, box, these little tiny box turtles? Uh, I said, sure. And then I started thinking, well, how am I going to do that? So I started looking as to what types of containers and so forth and so on have been used. And I found out that not very many uh, place, very many sources, uh, there's not very many sources on box, on, on uh, raising hatchling box turtles. And the sources that I found were somewhat superficial. So I used the things I found and added to it. And I, I made an a, a, a enclosure out of, out of wood. Well, I made that enclosure over 25 years ago. It used to be a dehydrator. And so rather than using it as a dehydrator, I'm, was, I'm using it more or less as a hydrator. And so that was step one. Then I started talk, looking into lights and so forth and so on and housing tubs and this and that. And uh, what I ended up with is what you see here. And I pay particular attention to the humidity. Um, the humidifier uh, operates 24 hours a day using distilled water. And not very many people heard about this, but during the, the worst of the COVID uh, situation, uh, distilled water disappeared. You couldn't find distilled water on, for sale anywhere around here. I, I, guess, I guess it was because of people buying it for the hum home humidifiers or such, or maybe it has something to do with preventing COVID. I don't know. Anyway, so I, I bought a, a distilling device. So I, I make my own distilled water and I make it out of rainwater. So the only water that has touched these turtles since I've had them is 
distilled water through the mist from the humidifier or rainwater, which I use to, for their drinking and, 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 and misting and things like that. Uh, the temperature, I keep it my, in my house. My wife and I tend to keep the house rather cool, but the room temperature uh, is, I try to keep the, the room temperature between those degree, those temperatures of 64 and 72, but I don't like it to get down below 75 during the day and below 65 at, at night. The way I do that is, as many of you are probably familiar, is through the, using a lights to generate heat. But I use three types of bulbs. I use uh, the, the, the big 125 watt full spectrum bulb, which mimics uh, sunlight and puts out heat and UVA and UVB, which are absolutely critical to the proper development of uh, hatchling box turtles and most all reptiles. Uh, without the proper amount of ultraviolet light, all kinds of bad things can happen to the development of the turtle. Absolutely critical for their production of vitamin D and calcium uh, uh, absorption and utilization. So that's, that's the main light. And uh, there is another one that I use. It's a 75 watt uh, incandescent bulb, but it's a red light uh, used for nighttime. It puts out heat and I use that for nighttime heat. But most of the time, including the day, the hatchlings are buried down underneath the uh, sphagnum moss and the uh, coconut, ground coconut uh, husk that I have in, the, uh, in their enclosures or their houses. And you see in the pic uh, lower left-hand picture, there's four containers in that box. And each, each container has two box turtles in it. And uh, the both lights are used uh, sometimes, and, but all the time the, uh, the full spectrum light is used. The third light I use is, the, uh, is a fluorescent light, which puts out very little heat. It's not for heat. It's simply to augment the UVA and UVB that the full spectrum light uh, puts out. But since they live pretty much underground, uh, they don't get those things very often. So I use the, uh, the two lights when they are soaking in their tubs with something I'll get to, to later. And so that's a little setup in my uh, home office. Uh, it's um, rather interesting. They don't make noise. They don't have bad smells. Uh, you could forget about them real easily, but uh, they've been living with me now for about six months. They were born hatched, excuse me, in pilot points about 12 miles north of me. Uh, a lady up there has several turtles in her backyard and she approached uh, the Leela people and asked if we wanted some hatchling box turtles. And that's when Sarah asked me when I take care of them. So I got them on uh, October the 16th. And that means I've had them about six months now. So that's, that's the uh, turtle uh, world. And here they are. Uh, eight of them. And you notice the little red dots on the back of them. Well, that those are dots that were made for the beekeepers. I did not know this. And so I learned a little bit about bees. Uh, the queens are labeled with dots and the color of the dots indicates the uh, age of the queen. And so I got some dots and I, uh, Research the type of epoxy to use to glue them on. And I found that what the San Diego Zoo uses, that's what I bought and used. And so here are the, the eight. Now the uh, photographs, as I note there, were taken on December the 6th and I had the turtles since October. I really couldn't uh, tell them apart very, very accurately until I label them some way. I, uh, I'm not very good with names. I didn't try to name them, which just that's, my grandkids find that appalling. They keep wanting to name them, but I'm better with numbers, especially numbers one through eight. That's easy for me to remember. And so that's, that's the names of the turtles. We've got tiny turtle number one through tiny turtle number eight. Uh, the blue grid that they're sitting on, each one of those is, is a centimeter. And so you can look at the relative size of the turtles, compare the physical size of turtle number one in the upper left-hand corner with turtle number eight in the lower right-hand corner. And then look at the difference in the weights of the turtles. Uh, turtle number one only weighed 6.56 grams in December. He weighed less than that probably in, uh, in, in, in October. And turtle eight weighs a whopping 12.05 grams. So from the start, uh, there's a big difference in the weights of these sizes of these turtles. 
I am assuming that that means they've come from more than one clutch of eggs. Uh, turtles, to me, turtles number one and two looked very similar in terms of size, and turtles uh, three and four looked sort of similar in size, and so did, and then five and six and seven and eight. So I could speculate we had as many as four different clutches. Uh, and the lady in Pilot Point did not know how many uh, parents were generated these, these turtles. So it's a, it's a mixed batch. And uh, you'll see some more about that later. But these are the little creatures. Another wordy slide. This is the feeding considerations. Uh, when I was young, as I mentioned, in, especially when I lived in East Texas and I was 10, 12 years old when I started playing with these turtles, uh, I had no idea what they eat, so I just fed them stuff. And uh, stuff is what they eat, but uh, there are some types of stuff that's not as good for them as other. And you can find lists uh, online, good foods to feed turtles and bad foods to feed turtles. Well, it's not quite that black and white. It's kind of like humans. There's a list of good foods for humans and list, list of foods for bad, list of bad foods for humans. But we all eat bad foods and it hasn't killed most of us yet. Uh, same thing with turtles. They can eat almost anything a little bit. The problem is, and the danger is, when you do not give them a varied diet, uh, a little bit of a lot of things uh, the turtle will be much more likely to be healthy than if you focus on feeding them just one thing. I have heard of a turtle that uh, was fed in its early life on marshmallows exclusively. Uh, that turtle is not, is, is deformed right now. Its mouth and shell is deformed uh, rather badly. And so uh, that's a, an extreme example, but variety, variety, variety. And yet foods on the bad list often have good traces of vitamins, minerals and such that the turtles need. It's okay to eat a, a bad one every once in a while. Like it's uh, okay for me and you every once in a while, like once a year maybe, <laughs> to eat a Big Mac from McDonald's. But it, it's not gonna kill us if all we eat is one. But if we, that's all we eat, I think a guy wrote a book about eating nothing but Big Macs and such for a year. And he was under medical care continuously while he was doing that. But there are some foods that should not be offered to turtles. The main thing is dairy products, processed meats, uh, leaves of certain plants, rhubarb, potato, tomato, tobacco, and so forth, poison ivy, an abomination, avocados. My wife's appalled. They can't eat avocados. Uh, lots of animals are not, it's not, avocados are not good for them. And then the last one, it, that, that goes without saying, they should not eat refined sugars. But guess what? We probably don't need to eat refined sugars either. They are truly omnivorous. I mean, seriously omnivorous. Uh, I have, um, I have uh, seen them eat, not the ones I have, but I have seen box turtles on the side of the road eating roadkill, munching on dead various things. Uh, one time out at uh, Leela last year for the ornate turtles that we were fixing to release uh, with the trackers on them, I was out there taking care of them one morning and uh, found that a mouse, uh, uh, probably a deer mouse, had built a, a nest underneath one of the watering containers and in the nest were two little tiny mouse-like things. And I thought, oh, what do I do? And so I was alone, so I smiled and said, I'll just do this. I fed them to the turtles. I even have a video of uh, one of the turtles eating a little tiny mouse and it's, it's rather grisly. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. The turtle uh, ate it, ate it all and ate it rather quickly. So they're omnivorous. They will eat meat, they will eat anything. But in that football field sized world in which they live, the vast majority of their food is not anything as exotic as carrion or, or mice and such as that. They're very opportunistic and they will eat pretty much anything, but uh, it balances out in the wild unless we alter it some way. Hence, it behooves us to make absolutely sure that what we're giving them is the quantity and quality of food and, 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 and care that they need. The adults need a diet of, of less than 50% protein, whereas the hatchlings need much higher diet of protein, 50 to 75%. And the hatchlings are better fed at least every other day. Uh, 
whereas turtles can go a long time without eating uh, adult turtles, uh, juveniles and adults, without it bothering them at all. It's not that big a deal uh, for them to go three, four, five, six, seven, eight days without eating. Uh, but the hatchlings, that wouldn't work out real well. And another problem, and I would have never thought of this before, is that the food for the hatchlings must be cut up because they literally cannot handle uh, you know, big bites. They've got little bitty tiny mouths, as you'll see when I show you some of them later. Uh, so that, that can get to be time consuming, but also with some uh, things, particularly live food, uh, it can, it's, it's not real pleasant for the one who is preparing the food. So the picture there is sort of the utensils and various things that I have used when I feed the turtles. Uh, the little white uh, jar top jars you see over there are the vitamins and mineral supplements that I use in the brown uh, tub or earthworms and uh, in the butter tub with the holes in the top of it, that's uh, uh, mealworms. And the butter tub without the hole on top of it, it's got vitamin uh, supplement, in, supplement in it. And I put the mealworms in there and shake it up so they're coated with the vitamin supplement when I feed them. And uh, on the plate, there are pieces of, of, of the protein-based thing. Well, there's a piece of apple on there, but one is a turtle meatball and one is a piece of chicken. And I'll talk about those later. So uh, the feeding is something that I've agonized over for quite some time until, especially until they started eating consistently. And here's another one of those, how many words can Hugh get on a slide? But the hatchling box turtle weekly feeding menu, you can look at that and I feed them every two days. Uh, and um, this is what they eat. Uh, now they don't eat all of that every day. Uh, I mean, every feeding you look, there's, there's, there's some overlap and there's uh, a lot of differences. The boiled white chicken, uh, that's the one I feel least comfortable about. However, that's their favorite food. And it's very, very high in protein. And uh, you can use a food that they like a lot, you can use as a vehicle to make sure they get plenty of uh, calcium supplement and vitamin supplement by dusting the, 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 the food before they eat it. And so I'm relying on that, but it's the one I feel the, the least comfortable with. And uh, you can see down there on the third feeding, I've got the earthworms. Well, another thing I learned, uh, there's earthworms and there's earthworms. The my, most common type of earthworm, it seems around here, and I know nothing of earthworms in their native habitat, I'm just basing on what I've learned in the last six months, uh, are the what are called red wigglers. They're used for fish bait a lot. They're the best worms for composting. And so I have some of them in my compost bin and in my yard, but the turtles don't particularly care for those. And uh, I've, I've tried for quite some, several times over a period of about two, three months to, to offer those worms to them. And they would eat them occasionally, but the vast majority of the time they would not eat them at all. Now I've also fed them night crawlers and that's a whole other story because they do like the night crawlers and they will eat the night crawlers. Uh, but like I mentioned, feeding little bitty tiny turtles big giant night crawlers doesn't work out unless you work on the night crawlers a little bit, which means chopping them into pieces. And that creates another problem because they are definitely sight feeders. They will much more, they're much more likely to, especially the, the juveniles, they need high protein. And I think that they're wired to look for things that move because that's what, uh, where they can get the intense protein that they need. So uh, what I call wiggly food, uh, mealworms, they love mealworms, but if all you feed them is mealworms, you got some problems. And they love the right kind of earthworms, but if it's wiggly, they usually can't eat it. It's just too big for them. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen a turtle trying to eat a small worm and the worm just wraps itself around the turtle's head and scares the turtle and runs off. Uh, well, yeah, he runs off. And so uh, that's one of the things with earthworms. It, they're good for them, but it's, 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 not, it's not an easy food to feed to little bitty creatures like this. One of the things that I have, uh, that I have, uh, oh, I want to show you the calcium and the vitamin supplements here. Uh, the, can you see those? I don't know if you can or not. But uh, the powdered form, and I use that every meal, they get some form of 
uh, supplement to to their to their diet. And from the lady in power in uh, Pilot Point, I got this uh, tur ball, tur turtle meatball <laughs> hatchling or turtle meatball recipe, and I have changed it to accommodate the needs specific needs of hatchlings. And you can look down that thing. Uh, there's protein, and there's fruit, and there's vegetables, and then there's some tortoise chow, uh, which is a commercial uh, product. Looks like dog food, but it's not. It's it's geared for just for turtles and tortoises. Uh, a whole boiled egg, including the shell, and then calcium and vitamin supplement, and then you blend all that together. Uh, it's quite exotic. My wife was was impressed when I was dropping earthworms and crickets and mealworms into the blender. Uh, it makes a, a lovely meatball thing, which I then form into balls and uh, freeze them, and then simply defrost them and feed them to the turtles. Now, since these are hatchlings, the balls need to be small, so I found a silicon tray, which uh, which um, I, I press the, the the meatball stuff into the trays, let it freeze, and when I dump it out, you've got little squares of uh, of, of turtle meat cubes, I guess you should call it. I cut them in half and feed uh, one turtle, uh, half of one of them. And so that's, I've got to make another batch of this this weekend for the turtles at Leela. And I don't use this recipe. The recipe for adults is different than the recipe for hatchlings. But that's the, my culinary expertise <laughs> with turtles. Typical feeding regimen. Uh, I want to talk about housing tubs first. Uh, now, the, the tubs I keep the turtles in in their housing uh, are the clear plastic. Uh, they're roughly six quart containers, about the size of a standard shoebox. But it's impossible for me, at least so far, to find any containers like that that are not clear. Everything's clear. That's okay to, uh, for their, their, their housing tubs inside the, 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 the big wooden box that I've got because there's nothing going on. They just burrow down and that's the end of that. But in the feeding containers, if it's translucent, they are distracted and turtles try to get out of things. They don't understand walls that they can see through, but they can't get through and it bothers them. And so I'm, I'm real careful to feed them only in opaque or dark containers. And the first one I tried was a little thing like this, and that worked great until number seven and number eight got big enough to start climbing out of it. So I had to look for others, and I finally found containers like this, the colored ones down in the lower right-hand corner. Um, these are made for kids to keep Crayolas and such in but they are safe for you know, humans to be around and, and, and don't contain any harmful chemicals or not many, I'm sure, but they said they're, they're, they're safe. And uh, so I use those instead. Uh, and that's what I feed them. And I feed them individually, uh, as you can see down there in the lower right-hand corner. And after I feed them, I put them in water. Actually, before I feed them, I put them in water, I should have said. I take them out of their individual housing containers and I put them in a communal container with, uh, with rainwater and they're warm to about 80 degrees. And I let them soak in there for a minimum of half an hour. Uh, that's where they do a lot of their, their pooping. And uh, turtles and, 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 and water tend to, uh, turtles like to have water around. Box turtles do not have to get in water every day, but if water is available to them, they will get in water. Uh, quite frequently, they can swim. Uh, uh, they can swim real well because their lungs are in the upper part of their shell, and so it acts as sort of a flotation device. But um, they 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 do like do like to be in the water. It does stimulate their appetite, uh, and so I put them in water for about half an hour. And when they're in that water, they are under the full spectrum lights, but also the UVA UVB enhanced fluorescent light, which adds extra UV rays, but not extra heat. And so I leave them in there for a while. And after I feed them, uh, and it takes about an hour to feed them, uh, somewhere, around, you know, somewhere around that, I put them back in a, in, in a fresh uh, water-filled container and uh, let them soak a little bit. That's mainly to clean off the, the bad food, or not the bad food, the, uh, the food that stuck to them from the feeding containers, but also to uh, let them defecate again. And you can see a 
a uh, little piece of floating poop in the upper left-hand corner and the pieces of food around the other, uh, around there. Now, one thing I wanna speak of, and this is pure speculation on my part, you see how they're all moved toward the sort of the upper right-hand or left-hand corner. Um, that's the direction, that's the direction uh, to pilot point from my house. Turtles have a, a very good sense of orientation and a homing instinct. That's one of the big problems with keeping box turtles as pets. They tend to want to get back where they're supposed to be. And as I mentioned earlier, born or hatched and live an entire life on a football field size area, they don't leave that area. If you take them out of that area, they will try to get back to that area. And I find it interesting that no matter which direction I orient this, this box, no matter which direction the light's coming from, I, I play games with it and move the, uh, move the, the, the soaking tub around and they always sort it out. They'll end up in the, the, the side of the tub that is facing pilot point. Now, that may be a coincidence. I don't know, but it, 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 it's an interesting observation I learned. They, they, they want to go back where they came from, I think. And over there on the, the right hand, the left hand side, the big kids ignore the little kids. Uh, see all the, 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 the big kids over there? They're not bowing to Mecca, they're bowing to pilot point. Bless their hearts. Ah, weight changes of hatchlings over time. This is interesting. Uh, I've weighed them one, two, three, four, five times, and then I've summarized what I found there. If you look on turtle number one, on the 28th of November, weighed 6.65 grams. Uh, December the 20th, 6.41 grams, lost weight. January, lost weight. I skipped February, that got mushed up. I had my daughter and her husband and two kids living with us in the about the time it was supposed to be weighing because their house had no electricity or water. And so we had an interesting house full and we had no electricity and water too there for a while. But anyway, there was no February weighing. So in March, 5.14. And you notice the absence of a weight on 414. Well, the story of tiny turtle number one, I'll let you read that down there. He, uh, I guess you call it failure to thrive because no matter what I tried to do, I could not get him to eat for the first three months. Then one day he started eating and I was so happy. I bragged about it. I sent a text message out to the turtle moms and told them the little, little tiny turtle number one's eating. Yay. And I thought my problems were over, but then he didn't eat again for like three weeks after that. And then he ate a little bit and this and that he couldn't handle the food even though I chopped it smaller and smaller, he'd bite it and then try to chew it. It wouldn't work. The picture there, you know, how not to eat a mealworm. He couldn't, he couldn't catch them easily. He couldn't, most of the turtles, they're, they're instinctively, they will go for the head of something. Basically, they see which way it's going and try to bite the leading end of it, which works out real well with, you know, mealworms and earthworms and stuff. But he bit it in the middle and there's not a whole lot he can do with it then. Uh, he, so he died and, uh, I was, it, it hurt, but then I, I realized, like I said, at the beginning, 80% mortality rate, uh, on hatchlings in the wild. Well, there's a 30% mortality rate on hatchlings kept in captivity. And so, uh, I, I, that's, that's not an excuse, but it's, uh, an acceptance of the reality. So if you look number five, almost doubled his weight. Numbers five and six are monsters. They will eat anything and they will eat everything. Uh, if, if you feed them pretty much whatever, they're very interested in it. They may not like it, they may not eat it, but they always walk over to it and sniff on it a good bit and mostly they eat it. So this is, um, this is the, the, what I've got right now. And um, I have no idea if this is good or not so good or whatnot. I don't know what the rates of turtle hatchling weights are supposed to, to, to change. I, I, there's no data that I've been able to find on this. And so I'm, I'm hoping, well, they're all getting bigger. And if you look at, back at the beginning where I mentioned that the weight of the turtle is the prime determinant of their ability to survive in the wild, 
they're getting fatter. Uh, I'm still concerned about number three. If you see right here, number three is my problem child now. He's only gained 1.33% uh, in, in the past six months, but he had a little trouble there where he lost some weight, but then he started eating again. He still is picky. He doesn't eat as, as much as the, the others do. So that's my, my data for them. And then what have I learned? Uh, it's real hard, as I said, to find information about hatchling turtles. Another thing here, if you start Googling turtles, you don't get box turtles much. You get aquatic turtles. Uh, there's a lot more data on aquatic turtles out there than on terrestrial turtles. Uh, now, sea turtles, of course, have there's lots of interest on them uh, in, in them. And so you can find an enormous amount of sea turtle information, but that doesn't work well for terrestrial turtles because they're, they're different creatures and have completely different needs. And so uh, box turtles, I guess it's because there's no commercial use for box turtles. No one's really interested in them except, except as a hobby like me or scientifically like a few researchers do. So it's, it's sort of hit or miss on this. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they probably came from more than one, uh, one clutch, and that would account for their differences in their original uh, initial weight and such. And, and uh, humidity is more important because like with, with humans or anything else, the smaller the, the, the person, the more susceptible they are to uh, changes in their environment, like high or low humidity or temperatures or stuff like that. Uh, they do are picky on which foods they'll eat. Uh, number... Number two, absolutely adores boiled chicken, but doesn't like the turtle meatballs. Number three is the one I'm having trouble to get any, get consistently eat anything. So I haven't quite figured out what he likes or doesn't like. Number four will eat uh, the turtle meatballs and wiggly food, and he likes apples. Uh, number six, number five will eat anything. But, but likes if you put the meatballs and the turtle chow in front of them simultaneously, number five will eat the turtle chow before he eats the meatballs. Number six is just the opposite, eats the meatballs before he eats the turtle chow. Number seven and number eight, they like their vegetables a whole lot and will eat the other, they eat everything. But the first place they go to is a little pile of, of vegetables. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's funny how different ones uh, have different preferences, so sort of like people and, uh, and we noticed that with the adult turtles at Leela as well. Uh, you have to take care of them every day. They, it's not something you, it's not like a cat, you can dump a bunch of food out and go away for four days. They need to be taken care of on a daily basis, monitored the humidity, the, the moisture, the, the misting and so forth, need to be fed every other day. Uh, so it's not something for someone who doesn't have a lot of time. I've got a lot of time. Uh, and then I mentioned there that the mortality rate is still 30%, even uh, with well-maintained uh, hatchlings. Number nine, they squeak. I've known that turtles make noises. Now, one noise they make is the adults, particularly when they quickly go inside the shell, you hear a hissing sound, air escaping from around their, their, their neck and their, 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 their legs from going into the shell. But these guys squeak, and I've seen them do that, mouth open and a little that's not a good turtle representation, but little tiny squeak. I'm sure it's just it's just air escaping from inside them, but that's what talking is. So uh, they they squeak. Uh, number numbers five and six squeak more frequently than any of the others. I've never heard two or four squeak, but five, six, seven, and eight. I've all heard them squeaking. So they do make little nice noises. And this is another one with lots of lots of stuff on here. Um, the references, I've got a little blurb up in the upper left-hand corner that reiterates what I've said before about how much information you can get. Some of it's bad information. I actually found some online sites that said, feed on cat food, feed your captive turtles cat food. Yeah, they, it's not going to hurt them to eat cat food occasionally, but that's not what the, the site said. That's the, it was their main food. And they said, you know, it's, it's a good food because it's nice and balanced for cats. These are not cats. For one thing, turtles' digestive system is extremely slow. Uh, from the time they eat something till it's finished processing and is, is defecated can take like four or five days. And so uh, they, 
they, they, the, the food sits in there for a while and doesn't go through as quickly as it would in cats and dogs and such. So I'm real leery of, of sites uh, that advocate the use of commercial uh, human food or other pet food for, for feeding the turtles. Then I've got some books down there, uh, three of them. This one in particular, I want to, to show. It's the Bible of, of turtles. This one right here. If you want to know anything about box turtles, uh, the Dodd text that I've got highlighted highlighted in red is, is, is the book to go to. But uh, again, it doesn't cover hatchlings. It doesn't really talk about hatchlings. It's just for box turtles in general. But it's, it's, it's good, real good. Uh, the journal articles uh, article, uh, the Teslev article was the one I mentioned about mentioned about head starting, and so I've referenced it several times. And then the online sources I've used I used all of these in putting together what I know about box turtles, uh, and they they all have good information in them. Some of them have more a higher percentage of good information. Others have a slightly less percentage of good information. A lot of redundancy, but. My way of looking at it is if it's mentioned positively in three or four different, from three or four different sources, it might be something I need to take into account. So if you're interested in any of those, I will be happy to send you this slide so you can, you can, uh, uh, you, you can use and I'll send it to you in Word uh, format so the links will be active. If you're interested, just let me know at the end of the, pre or after the presentation, text me or, email me and I will send you any and all of the information in this, in this presentation. I want to show you this. Uh, my wife found that. She said she absolutely had to get it for me because it looks like it's got three toes on its back, uh, back feet. And this is, this is the, 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 the Zen turtle. But the book, I'll show you the book. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not realize that. This, this is the book. You can get it at Amazon. If you're interested in box turtles, you got to have this book. It's 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 good. It's based out of Florida. The guy did his research on the uh, the the uh, uh, bar eye, the the box the box turtles that live in Florida. But a lot of it's just ge generic enough that uh, you can uh, apply it to pretty much anything. The contact information there, uh, my email address and my phone number, which can also be, you can send me tech, a text message and I'll be happy to reply the best I can. So we save the best for last. I have, oh, some box turtles for you to look at. You wanna see this one? This is, this is number, this is number eight, I think. Can you see the eight on him? I don't know. This is the one of the larger ones. And this is number six. Uh, he's much taller. Uh, and it, as a rule, I've been told with, with, with hatchlings, I'm told I read that males and females have a little bit of difference in terms of their height when they're hatchlings, but I don't know how accurate that is. But this is number six who will eat anything. And this is number seven, number seven, prefers his vegetables. Uh, he's, he eats his vegetables quite well. Number six, eats everything. And then there's number four, who's much smaller than the others. See the, the difference in the sizes between these two, two guys? So number four is one of the, the small ones that uh, he was more like number one when we got him, but he's, he's eating, he just doesn't eat consistently but he's, 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 he's doing fine, he's gaining weight. And so uh, the, the bigger ones uh, are forcing me to think about upgrading their housing. I'm, gonna, I'm thinking about putting them in a communal uh, container, a uh, big plastic food grade container that I got and see how well they operate communally. Now, box turtles in the wild are not communal at all. You, you don't see a bunch of box turtles together. They get together every once in a while to, to mate, but that's once a year, and they don't hang out with each other. And the, of course, the, the, the mother lays the eggs and walks off. And so there's no nurturing or anything like that. And when they hatch, they look like the, the adults, just in a microscopic form, little bitty guys. And uh, they're, everybody likes box turtles. 
and particularly little ones. And so uh, that brings me to this point. Don't, unless, you, unless you're willing to put some effort into it, don't keep box turtles as a pet. Specifically, don't keep box turtles indoors unless you're willing to go to great lengths to make sure they have the right humidity, the right temperature, and the right light, and so forth and so on. Uh, like a lot of other animals, uh, people unknowingly do a great deal of harm in uh, trying to keep them in environments that are not suitable to them. So if anybody has any questions, I will be happy to answer them if Jerry or somebody can read them to me or Rita. Yeah, I've got some. Um, Hugh, um, I, the first one is, um, did, did you lose power during Storm Uri? And if so, how did you manage to keep the turtles at the right temperature and humidity? My house, uh, it's a newer house and I have a fireplace and the house did not get below uh, 64 degrees. Uh, we had intermittent power outages and so it didn't, didn't get really cold. I was prepared to move the turtles in by the fireplace if necessary, but that never, never happened. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, I think you explained this one to, uh, Becky Bertoni was wondering when they are in the tubs versus the plywood container. Okay, they're not ever in the plywood container. The, the tubs are inside the plywood container. So I use the plywood container as sort of a shell and the four tubs are inside that. So they, they don't, uh, I, I'm not going to turn them loose inside the plywood container because of the moisture situation in, on the plywood. And I don't want to put any plastic sheeting or anything down because they do like to dig and their claws are very sharp. And, and I don't, I'm just avoiding that. What I found from a restaurant supply store in Chicago was a tub that fits almost perfectly inside the plywood container. And that's where I, what I'm thinking about doing over the next couple of weeks is taking the individual, the four individual housing tubs out, putting in the big one, just one, and putting all seven turtles in that one and see how they operate in terms of that. However, I will not feed them in the, in the container, their housing container. I'll still take them out and put them in individual containers because uh, they're, they're very messy eaters and I don't want to have bits of food and stuff in their, in their housing containers. So okay. that's uh, the wood is just uh, an external enclosure. Enclosure, okay. And then Becky also has seen bites out of prickly pear cactus. Could that be mm -hmm. by adult turtles? Sure, sure. Uh, the prickly pears are one of the, when I lived in West Texas, that was fairly common. You could see, if you look down at the bottom of cactus, you could see bites taken out of uh, uh, by turtles, but that's one of the uh, parts of the staple diet we've been uh, we fed off and on to the turtles at Leela, uh, the the tunas of the cactus. But you got to make sure if you feed them to take the take the stickers off. I guess um, let's see. Could you go through the process, um, the introduction, the hatchlings in the introduction? For example, um, we have questions about when you're going to move these turtles to Leela, but you know, there's really like three stages, right? Mm -hmm. There's the hatchlings, the juveniles, and then when they're ready to go. Can you discuss sure, that? Sure. sure. I, I have no idea when we're going to move these to Leela. They'll, we'll move them to Leela when I think they're big enough and Leela has proper uh, facilities for them. We can't put them in with the other two enclosures uh, that we have. Our, we've got four enclosures at Leela, but we've got two down by the visitor center itself. And that's the only ones that have turtles in them now. That's where they winter over and so forth and so on. We have two other uh, enclosures on the uh, east side of the park. We call it on Barn Owl Ridge. It's a different environment. It's higher elevation. It's not as, not as damp and it's, it's warmer. Uh, and those are the, where we put them when they're getting ready to be released. Uh, which means they're tagged and let go. Uh, so these guys are a long way away from that. I would say at least three years, uh, maybe even four away from that. Uh, uh, the, a rough rule of thumb I think that Sarah uses is that they can't be released unless at least two criteria. Number one, they've got to weigh 100 grams or more, four ounces. Uh, and number two, they can completely close their shells. Hatchling box turtles can't close their shells. They, they do not have a hinge on their plastron. Uh, they're, they're sort of like water turtles in that regard. They, 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 can't, they can go in their shell, but they can't shut it up. Uh, that hinge develops slowly over time and uh, doesn't really allow them to tightly close their shell until they're a couple of three years old. 
And so uh, the exact date at which these would be ready to go, um, I, I don't know for sure. I'm not in any hurry. I like them. And uh, also they got to be a certain size to have a transmitter put on them because there's a limit on how big the transmitter can be as a percentage of the weight of the, of the turtle itself. Yeah, and then um, somebody wanted to know um, what happens when you relocate them to um, a, a different place. And I guess, you know, what we've seen so far is that the turtles that we've moved out and are being tracked have, have stayed at Leela yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, they have. I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, these, I, I, I'm acting as if these are seriously focused on orienting, go back to pilot point. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if that diminishes over time uh, since they only, they only lived there for just a few weeks after they were, after they hatched and then they've been here for a much longer time. Uh, do they orient, will they eventually orient toward my house? I don't know. Uh, but I was relieved when Sarah was tracking the released box turtles from last year that they all seemed to stay in the general vicinity of where they released and didn't try to go back to from wherever they came. So that's a mystery. Science doesn't really understand the orientation and, and relocation um, uh, aspects of, of, of box turtles. They don't quite understand how that works, but it's been shown to exist. They just don't know why. Okay. Um, I guess, uh, I think that's all of the questions, uh, but you, there are several, um, well, several, many, many comments. What a great presentation this was, Hugh. And so I want to personally thank you for the work you put into it and uh, presenting today. The second thing is you have several recommendations. One is that you should think about presenting at the state chapter meeting in October. Um, I think there would be an interest for that. One, that's one of the chapter members recommended that. Another is that you should publish your work and perhaps do a couple of more videos since there's so little known about ornate box turtles. Well, uh, uh, Richard out at Leela mentioned something like that because I was talking to him about how I found there was really sort of a void in the literature as far as I found about hatchling box turtles. Like you, there's lots of relatively you know, great, relatively great deal of material about the, the, the adult box turtles, uh, but not on the hatchlings. And I'm, this is a work in progress. I'm, I'm learning as I go along. And so one of my goals is, yeah, I, I'm gonna put all that down some, somehow, some way. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, I'm intrigued by these things because uh, any, any creature that, it's like the it's like the Ridley Sea Turtles. Uh, they they you know they once they crawl out in the ocean, the ones that make it, they disappear for years. And science you know really doesn't know much about what goes on with those little guys till they come back uh, to the place they were hatched to lay eggs again. And so uh, these these guys aren't as oh as as sexy as the box as the sea turtles. They don't get the giant you know, attention and so forth and so on. But I, for some reason, I, one of them's looking at me right now, like it's time to eat. Today is feeding day. Uh, I am, uh, I'm intrigued by them. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to continue this. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to you, Jerry. All right then, Rita, thank you very much. Hugh, that was a most excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, you need to be admired for your dedication keeping those little guys going as well as the information that you have and what you've developed it's just really good and i think the uh, uh suggestion about the state meeting is something that you should seriously consider i think it would be an excellent topic for uh the meeting i'll have to trim my beard uh no you don't <laughs> but if you wanted to you could but That's again fine. thank you very much it was a great thank presentation you. thank you I enjoyed it.